Recently, Telegram founder Pavel Durov was arrested in France, supposedly because he was not allowing the French government access to the criminal activity that's going on on his Telegram chat client. But barring any political and social shenanigans, the question remains, just how secure is Telegram? Or what about any of the other messaging clients out there like Facebook Messenger and Signal and WhatsApp? Exactly how secure are these encrypted messaging clients? Hi and welcome back to Scotty's Tech.info. I'm Scotty with my co-host Cletus, the Tribble. Now, normally, we're all kind of motivated by what we hear. So we hear that Telegram or Signal or WhatsApp are super secure messaging clients and we download the app, we install it, and then we tell everyone I know, like, I use the Telegram because it's end-to-end -end encrypted. I use the WhatsApp because it's super secure and powered by unicorns and fairy dust. And we don't really understand what we're using or why. We just kind of grab it because we read it a little whatever. Right. So, is it actually secure? Well, the short answer is no. But the reasons why are kind of the most interesting part. Most people think that all Telegram chats are end-to-end -end encrypted. As it turns out, that's not the case at all. In Telegram, if you want to do a fully encrypted end-to-end -end chat, you have extra tapping to do to actually enable it. It's not enabled by default. So most likely, most users don't even know this and they're just installing it and they're off and running and they think they're secure, but actually they're not. What's worse, Telegram for desktop doesn't even have the end-to-end -end encryption option. Uh, don't know why, they just didn't do it. So that's kind of fun. But okay, what the heck is end-to-end -end encryption? Maybe we should start there. How does it differ from your normal vanilla encryption? Well, here you have the central server from Telegram or WhatsApp or whatever, and then you have two smartphones, A and B. Obviously, these two phones will need to communicate with each other somehow. In a more normal encryption scheme, what happens is phone A establishes its encrypted connection with the server, and phone B establishes a separate encrypted connection with the central server. Then they start sending messages back and forth. But obviously, the central server has to decrypt the message from phone A, and then the message will travel unencrypted, most likely, through that central server. Then the central server will re-encrypt it with the green encryption and shoot it down to the other phone. This means, obviously, the central server is kind of, well, the central hub, and you can read anybody's messages if you have access to the server. So that's not quite what we're looking for here. Enter end-to-end -end encryption. In this scheme, the central server essentially just acts like a relay to sh shuffle messages back and forth between the phones. And it's the job of the phones themselves to negotiate between themselves a fully encrypted connection from one phone to the other. What that means is that the messages being sent through the central server remain encrypted and the central server cannot actually decrypt them. This also means that the phones need to find some way to negotiate encryption between themselves without involving the central server. But we still have a slight problem here because now you can see there are little tags on the server and both phones. These are what we call metadata. If the central server is acting as a relay and it doesn't want to store much private data, then uh, phone A might attach a meta tag that's some kind of secret code that the other phone and the central server know, but that is not associated with, say, your first and last name and your address and your phone number. It's just a random code. and every system on the network knows that that code refers to your device. There's other types of metadata that can be included with the encrypted message as it's sent through the central server, and depending on how that metadata is implemented, uh, well, it can be a privacy slash data leak or not. It all depends on how it's done. So even end-to-end -end encryption isn't totally perfect. Okay, well, but if Telegram is a good, that means Signal and WhatsApp are even better, right? They're more secure. Not so fast. It turns out that if you dig down into the inner workings of the communication protocols that all these messaging clients use, they all use AES-256 encryption. Now, AES encryption was approved by the NSA in 2002. Mathematically speaking, AES-256 encryption is extremely hard to crack. You would need roomfuls of supercomputers in 200 million years to brute force mathematically crack the actual encryption algorithm. So 
It's great, right? Well, let's see what Wikipedia has to say about AES-256. AES is available in many different encryption packages and is the first and only publicly accessible cipher approved by the U.S. National Security Agency, or NSA, for top secret information when used in an NSA-approved cryptographic module. First, note that it says publicly accessible, which most likely means that the NSA itself, while encouraging everyone else to use AES-256, is not using it for their own encrypted communications. They're probably using something 50,000 times better. And the second thing to note is that AES-256 encryption is good for securing your messages and making them top secret when it is implemented in an NSA-approved cryptographic module. Hmm. So, does that mean that the implementation of the encryption makes a big difference? Yeah, actually it makes a huge difference. In fact, it makes all the difference. Enter a book called Crypto 101. You can download this book as a free PDF from the website crypto101.io. It's about 200 pages long, and unless you can't sleep or are really bored, uh, I don't recommend reading it. Fortunately, I read the whole thing. Uh, you don't have to read it. I'll, I'll give you the summary of what it says. In order to do that, I'm going to give you an example. Let's say I write a chunk of code, say it's in JavaScript, and I want to make my own messaging system, and I want to use AES encryption. Well, that encryption is built into web browsers, so I can just write some JavaScript code and I can make it happen, right? Except it's a little bit complicated. Like, it gets really hairy. Encryption is not easy to do, especially not easy to do well. So what I do is I hop on the internet and I search for a JavaScript AES library that helps me to implement encryption. Okay, so when programmers talk about libraries, what is that? Well, think of it as a car. The programmer wants to create a car. Of course, he could program all the parts himself, but that's not very efficient. So what he does is he goes, hmm, I need an engine. Well, let's see if there's an off-the-shelf engine. Ah, there is. Look at that. Okay, so I'm going to use the engine library sticks that in the car. And he goes, yeah, you know, I'm going to need some good wheels, too. Oh, look at those. They got, you know, aluminum alloy rims and low-profile tires, sporty, good grip. Yeah, okay, I'll use the, the, the tire library. And then I'm going to need a steering wheel with some fancy buttons on it. Yep, got a library for that. Let me pull that into my code. And there you go. Now I can continue programming car. So that's what a library is. It's just a chunk of someone else's code that's supposed to make our lives easier. So as I said, I may go on GitHub and I may find a chunk of code that helps me implement AES encryption. But is it good? Is it safe? Well, I mean, it's been downloaded millions of times. It's open source software. People submit bugs and the, the owner of the project fixes those bugs. So I mean, it, this is, it's super good, right? Millions of people use it. It's open source. Got to be great, right? No. One example given in the Crypto 101 book of why these libraries are epic failures most of the time is uh, key generation. So when you want to establish end-to-end -end encryption, you have a phone here and you have a phone here and you have a central server. If you want this phone to encrypt the data and for it to only be decryptable by this phone, these two phones need to somehow negotiate an encrypted connection themselves through a central server. But the central server and the rest of the internet isn't supposed to know or be able to figure out or eavesdrop on that communication. So what do you do? Well, each, each phone has to generate a secret key and pass it to the other phone. And there are many ways to do this. Many of these libraries you will find online, as the Crypto 101 book describes, will have a special function that takes a simple string of text to generate these secret keys. Well, there are problems with that without getting into too many hairy details because what many programmers will do is they'll go, hmm, gee, what am I going to use for my semi-random string of text to generate the secret key that will unlock the encryption? Ah, maybe I'll just use, like, I don't know, the user's password or their phone number or their email address, you know, underscore, underscore, their phone number, something like that. It's, that's random enough, right? Well, cryptographically, no, it's not random enough. And in fact, if you do enough of these boo-boos, when it comes time to the final encryption, yes, it will work. And yes, your project will be released and everyone will use it and they'll think they're super secure. But because you didn't do everything perfectly, the encryption is actually very, very easy to hack. 
when it comes to securely exchanging private keys between the two phones for end-to-end -end encryption, you should do something like a Diffie-Hellman key exchange, which requires not just a random string of text, but a truly cryptographically random, very long string, uh, actually a chain of bytes, preferably. So you get into like these very nitty-gritty details where if you do things the way everyone else does them as a programmer, right out of the box, it is not secure. And that, unfortunately, is what many of these companies are actually doing. I also mentioned earlier the, the whole metadata thing. Sure, you can be end-to-end -end encrypted, but depending on how you do that metadata, that can actually reveal a lot of private information that can either be intentionally or unintentionally harvested. At the end of the day, when it comes to chat and messaging clients, the whole point is just to get you to use their software. Most of these things are free, you're paying for it somehow, as with all publicly available software these days. Um, right. Uh, even Signal, which is widely regarded as the most secure messaging client in the history of the human race, even Signal is not as super secure as everyone thinks. In fact, it uses the same type of AES-256 encryption as everybody else. Now, it's true that Signal is regarded as more secure, and their protocol, which is also used in Skype and uh, WhatsApp and Facebook Messenger, it has been more thoroughly tested, as opposed to, for example, Telegram, the mProto2 protocol that they use, which also implements AES-256 encryption, but their mProto protocol as a whole, uh, as far as I could tell, it's been tested once by an Italian university. Because their code is proprietary, uh, they had to do this kind of automated testing, and they concluded, yes, okay, it seems to be secure. But when you're talking about encryption, it, it, it's kind of like scientific experiments. You need, to, you need to have multiple tests by multiple independent people. You need repeatability. Uh, you need to actually preferably see the source code and have it be open source so that people can find bugs and fix them and make it as strong as possible. One review that said, yeah, it's safe, like that's nowhere near enough. Uh, cryptographic algorithms, encryption is generally regarded as safe until it's not. And historically, when one of them is cracked, they get in laterally somehow, or there's, there's some flaw that's usually a human implemented flaw. So even though the encryption itself can be super awesome, well, the implementation wasn't. So oops. So not only is thorough testing required, but thorough ongoing testing is required, not just blind acceptance that, oh yes, this is super secure. Furthermore, while Signal is regarded as being super secure, they had a data leak in August 2022. 1900 users' data was leaked. Oops. Uh, this is despite having the best protocol and end-to-end -end encryption and all the other stuff. So your best option here is don't fully trust any encryption at all, because chances are, no, it's not 100% safe and secure. And if Pavel Durov's arrest is any indication, even chat clients where they don't allow the government in to spy on whoever they want to, uh, that seems to be coming to an end. So you do the math. But I'm curious to know, what messaging client do you use and why? Let me know in the comments below. For more techie tips, see scottystech.info. Thanks for watching. See you next time.